And now uh, to provide a little context as we uh, embark upon our screening of Losing Ground and um, our uh, inquiry into the contributions of Kathleen Collins, um, which we celebrate this evening, please help me welcome to the stage Peggy Damon Priestley. So I'm delighted to be here to share some reflections about my dear friend and my colleague, Kathleen Conwell Collins. Before we view what the New York Times uh, editor, um, Richard Brody, said was her masterpiece, Losing Ground. At this point in my life journey in my 70s, I think back on our friendship that I had with Kathy as a highlight of my life. Kathy was my friend, my sister, my mentor, my spiritual advisor, and a fellow artist. Kathy and I met as teenagers in various civil rights meetings in the early 1960s. She was from Jersey City, and I was from Harlem. And like so many colored kids in the North in the 1950s and the 60s, we were both angered and inspired by the Southern movement, protests against segregation and violence. Kathy and I were particularly impressed by the growing student movement, which fostered the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC. It was an incredible time to be a teenager, particularly for those of us who came from middle-class black families, where our parents' values insisted that we, too, were responsible for making the world a better place, doing something for our people. In the spring of 1962, Kathy and I were recruited to join SNCC and to travel to the Deep South to become SNCC field workers in the cause of black voter registration. Neither of us had ever been South before, so when we found ourselves living in the backwoods shack in Lee County, Georgia, we knew we were bearing witness with our very bodies to the fight for freedom and equality. We lived for that summer with an extraordinary woman who was the true freedom fighter. She was also a sharecropper. Her name was Mama Dolly Rains, and she bravely allowed us northern black and white students, so-called troublemakers, to live, with on, to live with her on her farm. By opening her home to SNCC students, she put herself and her family at great risk from the Ku Klux Klan and from the racist terrorists that shot into our home at night and burned the churches where we, where we taught voter registration and classes in literacy late at night. Kathy and I were arrested and jailed three different times for voter registration activities or for protest marches. I can vividly recall how Kathy's beautiful strident voice sang out loud when we were in the jail cells into late at night. And although we were often very, very afraid, we gained courage from these black men and women and children who were really brave enough to confront the brutal segregation by attempting to register to vote, sometimes walking many miles, many, many times to the courthouse. They risked their lives and some even lost their, their li they risked their jobs and sometimes even lost their lives for the right to vote in 60s America. And Kathy and I knew that these rural farmers and sharecroppers, they were the real heroes. Our baptism into the Black South, that incredible summer, was deep and life-changing for both of us. Kathy and I wrote fervently in our journals regarding the intensity of our experiences, the danger, and the historical significance of what we were doing was not lost on us but would have a lasting effect on the direction that our lives ultimately took. And that summer substantially affected our friendship. We had shared not only jail cells and the rural farmhouse of Mama Dolly, but also a newfound determination to make a difference in the world as young black women. In the fall of 1962, Kathy returned to Skidmore College where she had been a student and I continued my education by enrolling at Boston University. And over the next 20 years, we remained in close touch amidst our various marriages, children, civil rights activities, and our love of writing and filmmaking. 
We visited each other as often as possible and introduced our various husbands and children to each other, even though I moved to California in 1970. And of course, we spent long hours on the phone writing letters to each other about our lives and the world and our spiritual quest for illumination and understanding. Kathy's trajectory was to graduate from Skidmore College in 1963 and from the Paris Sorbonne University in 1966 with an MA in French literature and cinema. And although Kathleen always described herself primarily as a writer, she was of course an accomplished filmmaker and playwright as well as a songwriter. Her uncanny ability to observe and create enabled her to become an instructor extraordinaire at New York City College where she taught film editing and directing for many years. Even as a teenager, we knew Kathy was special and unique. Her staunch individualism had emerged that summer down south when we were in SNCC when she stepped boldly into an interracial relationship right there in the deep south. It is also said that Kathy's way with words, quote unquote, may even have inspired a young Martin Luther King with his I Have a Dream speech by paraphrasing one of Kathy's statements while we were all together in the Albany County Jail. Kathy's life would always take her on her own way. As she said in an interview for Black Film Review in 1986, just two years before her death, in all my, quote, in all my work, I take you to the explosive moment, but that's basically where I leave you. And she is also quoted in that same interview as saying, if I favor anything, I probably always favor the internal resolution before the external resolution. Because for me, the internal resolution is the most potent in the psyche. We can, of course, see that philosophy reflected in her films and plays. A daringness to present conflict and complexity without rendering a neat and tidy resolution. Kathy's genius did not always allow her an easy way to live. I've always admired the depth and daring of my friend Kathleen, both in life and in her work. And I salute her daughter, Nina Collins, for having the tenacity and the vision to resurrect this particular and extraordinary film by my dear friend. Please prepare to enjoy. Thank you. Well, Julie, that was it's good. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be together again on this stage and um, discussing another extraordinary movie. Um, the next time we do it, maybe we'll be discuss discussing your extraordinary work again. But thank you for making time for Kathleen Collins tonight. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. She was a big inspiration to me. Yeah, And, uh, you know, I knew about your New York roots and some of the beginnings of your story as we had done this prior work together about how you came to come to Los Angeles and your education and your filmmaking here and so forth. But I had forgotten to take into consideration that you would have been kind of involved in the New York independent filmmaking scene, too, and known a lot of the people maybe involved with this series. And yeah, I was just recognizing some more names as the credits were scrolling up that I knew Janice Adams and Kathy Sandler and, and uh, Cheryl Hill, who was production manager. But I met um, Kathleen Collins um, when I was working for Chamba Productions. I was uh, a production assistant in the office, and she was uh, editing, I believe, uh, Let the Church Say Amen. Mm. And she had her young daughter oh, with which her. which shows here tomorrow night. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I know, yeah. It's a small world, huh? <laughs> so um, that's when I met her, and it was about 1971 or 72 or something like that. and. Uh, yeah, what was that first impression? I can't even imagine. Well, here she was, an uh, African-American filmmaker who had just, you know, graduated from the Sabon in uh, France, and she had editing experience that I didn't have. She had production experience. She was a writer, a playwright, a screenplay writer. Uh, she was, uh, she ate health foods, <laughs> and I never even heard of health foods at that time. Um, I was an undergraduate student at City College, and um, and she was very, very friendly and very, very giving 
and so it was all it was it was kind of like remarkable for me at that time and uh she would invite me into her editing room and 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 show me how she was you know constructing scenes that they had shot and I just really at, had never met anyone like that who was so giving and did not say, well, you're just a lowly production assistant. You go to the store for us to buy our lunch. So, you know, I don't have time for you. Um, a little background on the um, where we were working. It was called Chamba Productions, um, and it was the five Chamba brothers who pretty much uh, owned the organization. It was St. Clair Bourne. Charles Hobson, Stan Lathan, Kent Garrett, and Tony Batten. Um, they usually didn't speak to me at all. <laughs> they didn't, the, the only one who uh, spoke to me for, it was uh, St. Clair Bourne, uh, but the others really didn't acknowledge me. But you know, uh, but when Kathleen Collins came in, she did acknowledge me, and she, like I said, she would invite me into her editing room, and so it was. It was a very good experience. Now, uh, that's interesting because it could be a question of just a young person paying her dues or um, one wonders how a woman uh, with everything that, that Kathleen Collins brought to the table, but uh, as a woman filmmaker in this atmosphere kind of you know, got along with folks and so forth. Was, this, uh, was she herself in the same position to be proving anything or? Uh, I don't think she had to prove anything. <laughs> she was very confident, um, very knowledgeable, perhaps more so than uh, maybe that's why she was so giving and the others who were kind of just working <laughs> on <laughs> not as, did not have as much experience or talent a, as she. Mm -hmm. um, she was a mother too, and so she was, you know, she mothered everyone, you know, who, who came in and out of the office and... Uh, that wasn't the only time I got to um, work with her. Uh, she, when she was teaching at City College after I had graduated, and, and she would have like editing seminars at Ross Gaffney's. That was an editing facility in New York City, and I was working on a film there, um, as she was. And she would come into our editing room and assist us. Uh, help us, <laughs> really, because she had more experience with, um, like I say, with constructing scenes and the pacing, and and that was the first time um, I heard the word the, or the phrase you you build to an apex, and after the apex, you know, you cut, <laughs> you know. Mm. Uh, so she had um, actually more experience with editing and with story than. Um, than my instructors at City College. Now here's a film too about uh, that you know is just coming to light. We're seeing we've seen a premiere this evening of a 33 year old film. Mm -hmm. Kind of an amazing fact, but about people kind of negotiating uh, the difference between the Apollonian side of their lives and the Dionysian side of their lives, and trying to get out of their head and into their body, and how to be an artist and a passionate artist and. Who else is making films like these and thinking about these things? Uh, not many people then, and certainly not many people now. Mm. I know that um, when this came out in 82, I was already in Los Angeles, um, but I did see it in New York, and it just blew me away. It was, it was, it was the film that I had been waiting to see, mm -hmm. especially from an African-American not just woman, I mean, other than Charles Burnett's killer sheet. <laughs> you know? It was, um, I l what I love about this film so much is the, it's, trans it's transformative. The complexities, multi-layered, the dialogue. Make you get these aha moments, and I was listening to the audience. People go, hmm, hmm, and then there's the wittiness, and there's just there's just so much to it that we don't get that we're so hungry for, and we, you know we realize that, or, or I realize that, you know, as as a culture, we're 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 famished for the cinema of ideas. Um, 
we're famished, we're hungry to be transformed. We, we accept lowbrow comedy because it's, it's, it's something. It's like, <laughs> like, you know, eating cheese doodles or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But when you see a film like this, and then it reminds you, as, uh, well, it reminds me of why I wanted to become a filmmaker and, what, and the things that I wanted to say and how I wanted to express them and the, and the myriad of ways you can express them um, and entertain your audience as well. So this was, um, this is a remarkable film and just like the film um, that we saw before, it's Suzanne Suzanne with Camille Billups. Um, that makes you, that makes you think. And what, a, what an extraordinary difference between the two, although they complement one another in terms of the inner life that they show and so forth, but the difference in class experience and the kinds of consciousness that come about, you know, for the characters and so forth, really striking. And all coming from that, you know, New York scene. Right. This is, this is a real treat. Um, and, um, I, I... I'm just so happy that it is finally being released. Uh, so uh, emerging filmmakers will have the opportunity to, to, to be nourished by this um, piece of work as well as know that, um, that it, there were, it exists. It exists and it's, um, it, it's just been <laughs> in the closet, so to speak. I'm kind of curious if we can if we can open up a little bit and speak of the um, the uh, the ambience of New York in general and the black filmmakers of the time, how many were finding each other and working on each other's work. I, I know of certain instances just from reading credits as we did tonight, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of really fascinating work going on all over town over this 18 year period, and um, did. I wonder if people were thinking of that they're now we're in a moment or we are a group and stuff like that. Well, yeah, there was a lot of collaborative work going on at the time, and there was also, um, you know, it was the tail end of the black arts movement, so you had the Studio Museum of Harlem, and I see they got credit for, you know, the um, participating, and there was Bill Gunn, who was also a director. He, was, he played the husband, and he had done uh, Gunger and Hess. Um, there was a lot of collaborative work, but there wasn't work on this level. Um, I think you mentioned earlier that Jesse Maple had uh, completed a film called Will, and I saw Will also, and but it wasn't it wasn't the same as this particular piece. Mm -hmm. That um, she really went off; she wasn't <laughs> goose stepping if you understand what I mean, in terms of, you know, African-American film genres, she, w she was pushing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and Kathleen Collins herself at this time is, um, uh, uh, it's interesting, she's such an individual intellect mm -hmm. and voice and so forth, and yet um, she, you, she, her name will pop up at various times in the series too, editing other people's work and being involved in other people's work. And, um, I wondered the degree to which it was uh, important or useful for her to be part of, to, be, to think of herself as part of a community or be supported by a community working in this way, or was she making a career just as an, an independent artist, you know, more um, in an insular way? No, she was very much a part of um, the filmmaking community in New York City because she was, um, the location where they shot this was um, Bill Gunn's home. Mm. And Dwayne Johnson was in it. Um, everyone involved with um, with this production, it seems like they were pretty much like the L.A. Rebellion. It, it's the same group of people over and over again. Ronald Gray, who also edited with her, who was part of the Black Filmmakers Foundation. I was part of the Black Filmmakers Foundation. Charles was as well. Um, so it... It was a collaborative effort, and and you know, the, there were many arts organizations around that also uh, assisted in in the not only the production but in the emotional support of filmmakers back east at this time. Do you remember um, 
the kinds of things that were said about the fact that so much important work would be finished and then not shown. That, um, you know, we're, we're showing several things here, as was mentioned, that mm -hmm. never received a proper release, and now we're, we're discussing them as though they were part of a history going on, but they're kind of a, some of them part of a secret history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was hard to get distribution. There were, they were being distributed, but they were being distributed to what's called an, on a non-theatrical track, to colleges, universities, museums, film festivals, and, and, and such, because that's how I got a chance to see it. And I know that I, I, I saw this film in a theater before. So it was being distributed, but it was, it was not a wide and general distribution uh, that was available to, um, to certain films. To independent films, let's say mm. certain independent films. Yeah. Now, um, I wonder uh, in in the encounters that you had with Collins, how much of the time you may have seen her on a set or directing people, and sort of to know what her energy was or how she was in the creative process. She was very high energy, um, uh, but I only got a chance to see her in various editing rooms mm. for the most part. Um, and I know that she was very close to Phyllis Klotman Indi at Indiana University, and Phyllis Klotman was, you know, uh, the doyen behind the starting the black film archives there, and that um, Kathleen Collins would spend a lot of time with her out there writing and editing and teaching classes as well. Uh, but I never really got a chance to hang out with her because I was much younger than she was and, <laughs> and certainly not on her level. Um, and I, but I, whenever I was with her or in her presence, she, was, she would embrace you in a way that was very, you know, she would draw you into her sphere mm -hmm. and she was very giving. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting how much of the time the lead character in the film and people around her spend talking about her personality and that she's cold or intellectual or she, she goes to be read by somebody and they give her this feedback she doesn't like and so forth. And it's very interesting. You, you can't help but think, you know, how no, much Kathleen of this is No, Kathleen wasn't it? like that at all. She wasn't like that at all. Like that character, uh -huh. that Sarita, no. No, that's the question it begged, so that's the yeah. question I was asking. <laughs> no, no. She was um, witty and charming and knowledgeable and chatty and... Um, full of energy and life. Yeah. But you know, it sets up a really interesting problematic, you know, that there's a, there's a kind of a woman's experience or black woman's experience now that is highly intellectual and very much, you know, about intellectual problems and, you know, how to get your, uh, your thinking life in line with your lived experience, in line with uh, everything else and so forth. And let alone, you know, what was being done in movies, but was this on the street as well? Like, I mean, it, it just speaks to a class experience, I guess, that is very little depicted in films, and as we say, you know, very different from Camille's film. Yeah, it's, it's Camille um, Billups comes, came from a very middle-class family in Los Angeles, middle-class black family. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Um, but anyway, back to this. Yeah, people were talking about things like this on the street, but no one was really putting it into a visual language. Mm -hmm. So that's, no one was brave enough. It's just coming to me. No one was brave enough because everyone, I, th I, I think for the most part, people wanted to fit in with the, well, like I said, it was a tail end of the black arts movement fit in with um, doing a broader social political thing. And, and this, was, this was the cinema of ideas. The next place it seems to come up in the series that I can think of is in actually in Ganja and Hess, in Bill Gunn's film, where in this kind of vampire situation, vampires get to be metaphors too for different ways of living and treating people. And Absolutely. making choices. So the two of those minds together in one film is really interesting. And the kind of a man that gets set up in Bill Gunn's character, but set up by Kathleen Collins, that he then performs for her. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a brave performance by Bill Gunn because he didn't play your average African-American male on the screen, especially during that time. 
he he allowed himself to be very exposed and vulnerable and all these things and to be you know the the audience even react like oh do you look, did you see his face you know most men don't act like that on yeah. film yeah mm. yeah and very much of them. yeah <laughs> 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 um well, there's plenty more I'd like to ask, but I also wonder if uh, in the audience we may have any questions about the film, things we may know about the film, or thoughts that you might have about the film, or about Kathleen herself. Um, oh, yeah, I see a hand right here in the middle. And there's a microphone we're going to share between us so everybody can hear the question. Here it comes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious as to where exactly was the geography of the whole film? Like the apartment, what part of New York was that? I don't really know where the loft apartment was, but where the, um, that was Bill Gunn's house up like in Nyack, New York. It was, yeah, upstate. And they were on the campus of City College where the young director was directing them. Yeah. Another question now? Um, this New York, LA thing, I'm kind of curious about because that the, this fact about Camille Billups, I didn't even know, and it kind of it complicates the idea of there being just two coasts and the coast right. kind of in isolation. Yeah, as you know, we were the original uh, before the hip hop wars. Uh, the New York East, <laughs> the East Coast, West Coast beef was going on with <laughs> filmmakers too. Not, it was kind of unspoken, but there was a tension. <laughs> And I kind of didn't really fit in either place because I was born and raised in New York and started out in New York. Then I came to Los Angeles. And so it was like, I was kind of a neutral zone person. But Did people manage to network or was it useful to know, you know, what, what, was somebody's... That um, was the only way you could really make a film is you had to network and you had to work with like-minded people. I mean, especially when uh, we were doing chemical um, filmmaking with the celluloid film. It's very expensive and the equipment was expensive and you needed help. You, but it wasn't like running around with a 5D camera. Mm -hmm. You really needed a crew to, you know, to, to get your voice out there, to create your projects. So yes, um, there were lots of cells of people working together. And you know, the, the premise of the series is that um, there are brackets formed by, first these, these movements begun by people like William Greaves, uh, setting up Black Journal and these television programs and so forth, and getting people kind of busy and, and working consistently, making documentary for television and making independent documentary. And then on the other, other end, Spike. And that kind of plateau that was hit, you know, when um, She's Gotta Have It kind of hit the mainstream. Well, Spike came out of all of that, too. That same William Greaves, History, Stan Lathan, Black Journal, Soul, um, Black Filmmakers Foundation, Ioka Chinzera, and, and uh, Huddlin' Brothers, and Spike, you know, because he had Joe's Bed-Stuy Barbershop. Everyone always thinks that She's Gotta Have It was his first film, and it's no, it Joe's bed -Stuy. And he had several other films, too. Um, uh, even before Joe's best side. And so ev everyone knew everyone and everyone was working together in some kind of way collectively. Now, so um, I'm curious whether the historicizing of this activity in New York is just beginning right now, or are people thinking in terms of that periodization that, um, well, the, these are the big plateaus, or if you happen to remember that, for instance, a particular film got released or something happened that represented a big beat in a history. Gunjan Hess, mm -hmm. I think, was um, a Bill Gunn's film, um, and um, that was a major beat. Um, the fact that it was recut so many times and it was taken away from Bill Gunn, uh, there was a big debate over whether it fit into the um, pantheon of African American films, and w was it acceptable? Was it? Did people understand it? And all of those, there was there was a lot of controversy around it. And then after that, then it was um, uh, Sweetback, mm -hmm. um, Melvin Van Peebles, and and then Spike. Mm 
She's yeah. got to have it. He kind of eclipsed everyone, kind of jumped and got the distribution and just opened the door. Spike's um, film actually opened the doors for um, a lot of other people. See, we got a question right here. Oh. Julie, in reference to you know this e east-west kind of rivalry, uh, it was funny when uh, when uh, we announced this series. Uh, Billy Woodbury called me up, and he goes, "The counterattack is happening." <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and then he and then he corrected himself, and he said. Well, I mean that in a good way. It's it's good that you know that that after L.A. Rebellion finally got all put into some kind of context that it's now happening with the yeah. The well, New York actually, filmmakers. actually, with Daughters of the Dust, uh, it it became kind of controversial because um, my film was the first film by an African American woman to receive wide and general distribution, and some people found a problem with that kind of title being attached to it because Losing Ground was made years before and Will, Jesse Maple's film, was made years before, but they had not gotten distribution. So, you know, we all, I always have to be clear when people say, well, it was the first film made by an African-American woman, I have to say the first, first film to get distribution and to, you know, play for 36 consecutive weeks in New York City. <laughs> but it was not the first film ever made by an African American. <laughs> right, it's not the first film ever made by uh, an African American woman because we can go all the way back to 1922.